So we're here to talk about leadership, we're here to talk about learning, we're here to talk about the game. And what we're going to do is introduce you to somebody who's played a pivotal role in, uh, in Canadian women's soccer. We're going to give you an up close and personal experience. You're going to meet her and learn a little bit about her. And we're going to do this in, in really three segments. Um, so just so you know, we're going to, I'm going to ask her some questions. I'm going to ask Diana some questions for about the first 30 minutes, back and forth. We're going to learn about her background, where she's from. We're going to learn a little bit about um, how she prepares for games. We're going to learn about how she sets goals. I'm going to ask her some questions on that. And then we're going to learn a little bit about that whole Canadian Olympic experience. And we're going to learn about that in just a second. And then to finish my part off, what we're going to do is have a special guest come up and join us and talk a little bit about what it takes to achieve at the Olympic level and how do you get there. How do you train? How do you prepare for training? How do you prepare for matches? And so on. Does that sound good? Yeah. And then what we're going to do is then we're going to turn the floor over to you and you're going to ask the questions. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're going to ask the questions. And by the way, the people who sat at the back, I'm going to ask you first for questions, okay? Yeah, that's right. Sitting at the back, you thought you're, you got out of it, but no, you're sitting, I'm going to ask you first. So are we ready to go? So we're here to introduce you to somebody who uh, scored a very important goal and the best way to talk about that is to show you what happened. So let's roll the tape. They wanted to see the flag rise, they will see the flag rise. It is a triumph for Canada's women's team as they win the bronze medal at the London Olympics. Said, oh, girls, stick to the task, stay on task, and uh, we'll be there. And we were. Yeah, it started hitting us that we're in the semifinals of the Olympics and going to Old Trafford. It's going to be a very tough match. It always is against the USA. We're not going out without a battle. Schmidt with the delivery towards Christine Sinclair! It's an hat trick for Christine Sinclair! O'Reilly with the delivery in towards one back. It's Morgan with a header! It is heartbreaking for Canada! Ejection following the defeat in the semi-final in dramatic fashion to the United States. Canada gets the chance to play for a bronze medal. Desi Scott, 
They were just remarkable. And to see Swaby Schmidt covering the ground, they were possessed. You know, France, all credit to them, they were outstanding. They were the better team for long periods, but you've got to put the ball in the back of the net. And we weren't going to let them do that today. I'm just so proud of this team. We battled through exhaustion today and uh, came out on top. Always trying to get the best I can find in the different areas that the team needs. So. The ultimate goal for London is to, to bring home a medal. And I think on any given day, we can beat any team in the world. Four FIFA Women's World Cups, three Olympics, three Pan Am Games, and two bronze medals. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome Diana Matheson. One? Yeah, you do. All right. <laughs> okay, okay, so, so I, I can't help but get a little vicklempt when I see that, because uh, I watched it. I watched that game. I watched the Lond the, uh, the the game against the UK. I watched the USA game, and I watched that. And every time I see that, it just brings back to me just a flood of memories. I can't imagine what you feel when you think back at that moment. Uh, like, let's just jump right into it. I mean, I think there's so many things I want to talk about, but let's just let's just start with the obvious. That moment, what was it like? Uh, that was. Do you guys even remember that? You guys are like that's so long ago, right? Four years ago, five years ago. But all the parents I know, you guys remember it more than anyone, right? Yeah. Um, that moment of the goal is just completely surreal. I think you could see it on my face when I was celebrating with my arms out. Just. It was the 93rd minute, I knew the game was over, France had been pummeling us for 93 minutes. We were exhausted and we're not going to make it through overtime. Because uh, from the USA game we were just physically and mentally exhausted. And it was the hottest day in the history of England, which is what a guy in the crowd told me after, so it must be true. Uh, so we were so tired in that game and when that goal went in it was just relief and joy and knowing all together as a team that we We've done what we went out there to do. There's a technical piece in there I want to touch on, and you, you chipped that in, and then you, did, then you finished. Is that right? I think you chipped it in, and then you followed it in? Um, I think, well, it was kind of bouncing, so it was a bit of, of a half volley, and then I think you can see I'm going to celebrate before the ball was even in the back of the net, because it was a deflection, the keeper was nowhere in sight. Uh, Kaylin Kyle dove out of the way because she was going to be offside, and I was off celebrating. <laughs> I think we just saw that, right? There was quite a bit of celebrating, yeah. right? That was the first medal that Canada has won in traditional team competition since 1936. Way to go. Thanks. High five. Hey, thanks. <laughs> and it's the first back-to-back -back medals since even longer than that, I think for over 100 years. So I, I, I want to I talk about a couple of, but I just want to go back to, so I really want to know what was said in the, in the dressing room after what motivated you after that USA game to prepare for the bronze medal match? Because the USA game, I mean, there was a challenge on so many levels and there's some controversy afterwards, but the reality is, how do you lift yourself up to that level of play at yeah. that point? What was said? Um, well, Christine Sinclair, our captain, she really stepped up in the locker room after that game and everyone was just crushed. I mean, we'd lost to the US before, but we just felt like we'd outplayed them and we were robbed that game and we were all pretty broken. Uh, and Sinky just spoke up in the locker room and she's not a super vocal captain, but when she speaks, everyone listens. And she just said how proud of everyone she was for that performance and that we were going home with a medal because that's what we came here for. That said, I didn't hear her say any of that because there's people randomly selected for drug testing after every game and I was selected, but I heard it was very moving. <laughs> and I've heard people tell that story many times, so it is true. Uh, but I was actually in drug testing with Alex Morgan at the time, oh, so really? that was great, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, so there's a journey. Uh, in life, uh, we all have journeys and we all get to certain one, one point in our lives where we achieve that type of success, but we all come from somewhere, we all start from somewhere, so let's, tell, let's talk about that, that story. So, uh, where are you from? 
You're from Ontario, I heard, I'm right? I'm from Oakville, Ontario. Grew up playing soccer and hockey. Do we have any hockey players also? Doubles for? Nobody. What's the, what, how, bi how big is uh, Oakville? Uh, 150,000 maybe mm -hmm. now. Yeah. And so how early were you, were you when you started playing sports in general? Uh, I think it was five when my parents put me in sports. It was pretty active, so they just threw us in a bunch yeah, of yeah. them. Yeah. What was the first sport you played? Uh, soccer. Soccer. And so at what point did you decide to get it, uh, play hockey as well? Uh, I think I started playing hockey in grade five because my older brother played hockey and I thought he was pretty cool, so I wanted to play hockey as well. What position did you play? Uh, I was a winger. In hockey, you're a winger? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And so how long did you play hockey? Uh, I played hockey until I finished high school, but around 13, 14, when soccer was getting a little more serious with the provincial program, mm -hmm. then I kind of prioritized soccer because it was always my number one favorite sport, but I kept playing high school hockey until I, until I left high school. So is your family originally from Ontario? Did you move there from somewhere? No, nope, from Oakville, from Ontario. Oakville, grew born up there and the whole time. Yeah, yeah, the whole family's around Toronto. Brothers and sisters? Yep, older brother, younger sister, parents, and all of them are hardcore fans and they come to all these games, which is pretty great. Did any of them play when you were playing? Did they play sports? Uh, Probably, my brother yeah. played hockey as well, uh, and my sister played soccer, and she played soccer for University in Canada. Was uh, any competitiveness in the family? Were you guys competitive with, she, with each other? And uh, yeah, we were pretty active family. Usually, my my younger sister and I would try and gang up on my brother whenever we could. Did it work? Sometimes. Yeah. 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 But he could always run faster, so we could only do t so much to him. Yeah. So you started out in, um, at age five playing. Uh, how long did you play ca community soccer? Um, I played. I, well, I played for Oakville House League, I guess, until maybe 12 when the rep program started. Everything's mm -hmm. so different now. And then the provincial program started when I was about 13. There was an under 15 team and an under 19 team, and I think that was it at the time. Uh, I actually got cut from the provincial team the very first time I tried out, but I had a coach for Oakville who really believed in me at the time and he, and he got me into another tryout later on and I ended up making the team that way. What's your earliest memory of soccer? I can remember my first team was the white team uh, and Oakville Hydro was a sponsor and we got a cool pink neon hat at the end of the season. Really? So I remember that. How old were you? I think uh, I was five. You were five. I remember the hat. Do you still have the hat? Okay. Somebody probably, your mom probably has that. No, but I found like my first rep jersey when I was, I don't know, oh, yeah. under 12 or under 13 or something and it fit surprisingly well. Because yeah. you know back in those days, with, like parents when you were getting the soccer jersey, it was there were all the boys jerseys and they're, hopefully it's better now, I don't know. But they're all like eight sizes too big so it still fits. Yeah. My jerseys from that, that, that time don't fit very much anymore, so you hear me? Uh, parents hear me, okay. So uh, five, you started playing, 12, you started playing rep around that time. Um, do you remember how much you loved the game in that, that snapshot there? I mean, what, attract, what, what kept you playing at that particular point in time? Because it was community and then you went into rep, right? Yeah, I just, I love to, I love sports. I love to, I love hockey as well. Uh, I'm definitely a team sport person. I love hanging out with other teammates. Uh, I wasn't the most outgoing kid ever in school. I was pretty quiet uh, inside, but as soon as you put me out for recess or whatever to play sports, then I kind of came out of my shell, so sports were pretty great for that. So it's, you're 12 years old. Uh, talk to me about how that, um, that decision came to play rep and, and what happened next. Uh, I I think I just kept going wherever you know I, I could go. So there was a rep tryout, so I'd try out, and there was no grand design at any point. There was the provincial tryout, so I went for it. Didn't make it, as I said, and the coach kind of got me another tryout. And it was kind of similar as I got older. Uh, I didn't really get called up for any of the youth national teams. I didn't have big dreams of going to the Olympics because you didn't really see women's soccer on TV that much. I was just playing because I love to play, I love the, the girls and women I got to meet and you know I planned on playing soccer maybe in university and then going and working in a bank or whatever the plan was going to be. Uh, but yeah, no no big designs, I just love playing and kind of just went wherever the game was taking me. I think soccer is more fun than banking, yes. would you say? Yeah. yeah. Okay. That's, that's the joke, my that's teammates said decision. if I didn't play soccer I'd work in a bank in a pantsuit. <laughs> That's it. It's okay, it'd be kind of fun. It'd be kind of fun working at the bank with the medal around your neck, right? Yeah. Great way to establish really. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's just jump ahead here. So you you mentioned something earlier where you made the Canadian women's national team in 2003. Is that right? Yeah. Um, but you had not made any of those youth teams before. So how does that happen? Because right now. 
you know, there's that trend where, you know, the men and the women make the U15, the U18, mm -hmm. the U20s, and they're 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 selected and, and forth. So how did you just do a walk on? Like what? How did how how were you? How did that happen? Yeah, uh, and that's how it is for most of the girls on the team. There's kind of a pathway, ideally, mm -hmm. that they're catching all the best players, and you're going up and developing with the youth national teams. Uh, I just wasn't called in at any point. I was training with the National Training Center mm -hmm. out in um, kind of like the RECs or regional programs, mm -hmm. whatever they're calling them now. Uh, and there was the under 20, actually under 19 team that was back in 2002 that did so well here. Parents, if you remember that, the, they got silver, the under 20 tournament. There was like 30,000 people at Commonwealth. Uh, so I didn't make that team. And I knew a lot of the girls from Ontario. They were my friends, they made this team. Um, and it was it was pretty disappointing and I was kind of aging out of the national training program So I thought like I said I was gonna go play at university mm -hmm. and that was it uh, But I had another coach with a provincial program who Believed in me again, and, and he got the national team coach to come out and watch one of our training sessions and kind of keep an eye on me uh, Which was nerve-wracking because I knew he was there the, the coach had given me a heads up uh, but I just went out and and just worked as hard as I could and left it all out there and uh, it was enough to get my first invite to the national team back in 2003. So, and then I just stuck around. Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't let them get rid of me. So I, I just want what to, what, what does that look like? Do they just do they send you a letter? Do they call you when you get an invite? Yeah. yeah. Back in those days, uh, it was a telephone call. I don't think email was re reliable. Do you remember that call? Uh, yeah, I think my mom picked up the phone and then she passed it to me and said it's the, or I think it was the national team manager and passed it to Were me. Were you expecting yeah. a call? Uh, no, and I was so nervous going into that camp. So, so you're walking across the kitchen floor to pick up the phone, you, you pick up the phone. Yeah. And the phone can only go so, so yeah. far because it had a cord and it used to be attached to the walls. <laughs> was it the dial rotary that nobody here? Oh, no, none of the kids have ever seen. Yeah. Was that. The downstairs one wasn't that. Yeah. Okay, so you pick up the phone, you know, hello, this is Diana, what happens next? Um, I, I think he just said, you're invited to camp, would you like to come? And I'm like, yes! And then, uh, yeah, the, the, the first camp was in Portugal, and I'd never been out of North America before, so yeah. I was pretty scared. Okay, just hang on, don't, don't go too far ahead. the email, the airline ticket. Actually. Really? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, just These are not getting this at let's, all. No, let's talk about the phone call for a second, because these yeah. are moments in lives, right? So, you get the phone call, you hang up, and then... And then it's like, is it just the rest of the day is like normal? No, it's not, right? I think it was an evening call, and then I probably didn't sleep. I don't know. It's probably excited. totally excited. Yeah. And family knew, friends knew, and it was mm -hmm. it was an achievement of a dream. Is that right? Yeah, definitely. Okay. Yeah. So then what happened? You got invited to the camp in Portugal. Yep, it was in Portugal. Um, I got my first cap, uh, my first game for Canada against Norway. For the last ten minutes, I got on. Uh, Evan Pellerud was the coach at the time, he's Norwegian, and I think he was yelling me instructions, but I, I wasn't listening at all. I was just so excited to get on the field. Uh, yeah, and that was the... You mean you weren't listening to your coach? It was just, just too, yeah. So Colin, so, Colin Miller is here, the head coach of the FC Edmonton. Colin, do, they, do the players always listen to you when they're on the field? Teenager, no. <laughs> as a teenager, yeah. Okay, so you're in Portugal, and there's a connection to Norway later, which we'll talk about, because you went and played there professionally, right? So you finished your first cap, um, what was that experience like, finishing it and walking off the field, first time to represent your country? It was, it was fantastic. We had tied that game and everyone was pretty disappointed, so I couldn't be outwardly too excited, but it was, yeah, a huge moment. And Cara Lang, who was already on the team before me, I think she was only 15, she made a point of coming up and saying congratulations in that Mandela. Really? Yeah. My so do you, nobody. so that's a good lesson, do you do that, you're one of the veterans on the team now, do you do that with some of the young players coming up n to never miss those moments of somebody's first? Yeah, cap? definitely, big caps are, uh, or first caps are a big moment in people's careers or first goals, so we try and always uh, give those players a shout out or, you know, maybe give them that game banner, that sort of thing. Yeah. So, 2003, you start with the national team and then at some point in the next three or four years you end up at Princeton. Mm -hmm. and was that a scholarship, NCAA? Uh, How'd well, you end up there? 2003, I was in my last year of high school, so yeah. I'd already applied to schools. I think I was already planning on going to Princeton. Mm -hmm. um, I knew a couple Canadian girls who had gone down there, and they loved the school. I knew I wanted to go to the U.S. because uh, most of the women on the national team were going through the NCAA, mm -hmm. so I wanted to go that route. Uh, and then Princeton's a good academic school, so I wanted to go there. Did they find you? Uh, I wrote to them. I wasn't with a lot of the youth national teams, any of the youth national teams, as I said. 
Uh, so I wasn't really recruited by a lot of schools, so I wrote out to the ones that I wanted to go to and and so Princeton you, let so me. So you wrote to Princeton before you made the team in 2003, is that right? I believe so, yes. Because that was my last year of high school, and then I ended up taking a year off before I went to Princeton because yeah. of Canada soccer stuff. At that point, did you think that your career was going to span what it has? I mean, you're getting rid of your post-secondary. You were out going after a degree in economics. Is that right? BA, yeah. BA arts and economics. Did you think that you were still going to be with the national team all these years later and playing no, professional? No, I wasn't thinking that. I was 18 and you're already getting banking, excited. right? Yeah. <laughs> well, no, just still playing soccer and seeing where it would take me and enjoying the journey. Yeah. So your time with Princeton. Um, tell me about that because there was some interesting accolades at that period of time as well. Uh, Princeton was great. Most of the, the girls, like I said, play in the NCAA, but some stay in Canada and go to school too. Most people love their schools. Mm -hmm. It's a pretty great excuse to play soccer and get an education. We're pretty lucky. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and we were pretty good at soccer my freshman year, which is how they say first year down in the U.S. You're welcome, guys. Free tip. Um, and then we weren't so good after that. But good education, beautiful campus. If you guys are ever near Princeton, check it out. It's beautiful. So you're Canadian. Playing it in a an American Jersey, by the way. I don't know if you knew that. So if you're a, in New Jersey, Princeton's pretty. A Canadian playing on an American uh, university team, and you got selected for the All-American first team. Yes. Is that right? Yeah. Did I get that right? But I was a super old freshman because I'd taken a year off, and we used to have OAC in Ontario, which was grade 13. So I was like two years older than all the other yeah. freshmen. So I was cheating. I well, turned 21 my freshman spring, guys. That was pretty cool. Parents again. <laughs> What was the competition like uh, in NCAA versus Canada and, mm -hmm. and what you'd experienced here? Uh, I, I'm not sure. I didn't play Canadian mm -hmm. university, so I'm not sure how it is up here exactly. Um, you, there's a ton of U.S. schools. A lot of them are really good at soccer. Some of them aren't. A lot of them have really great educations. Some of them don't. So if you guys are looking to go down there, just make sure you do your research. Um, we Princeton was always solid. We got we beat a lot of teams, but we also got beat by the tougher teams too. Yeah. So you graduated. Yes. Got your degree. Yep. And then decided to go to Norway. Yes. How did that happen? Like all of a sudden, was that as soon as you graduated? What was the time period before you ended up in Norway? Uh, so that was in 2008, uh, and at that time, Evan Pellerud, he was a coach, as I said, he was Norwegian, and he'd made the program a lot more professional. Uh, before him, it was it was kind of amateur in the way it was run. A lot of players had second jobs. He came in and kind of took everything up a level. So at that time, more and more players were playing soccer professionally year round. So mm -hmm. if you wanted to keep succeeding for Canada, that's what you had to do. Uh, and he had inns in Norway, and my teammate at the time, Rian Wilkinson, was already on the team over there. He was coached by Hege Risa, who is a legend in women's soccer. She's Norwegian. Uh, no way you guys remember her. Uh, so I went to Norway, yeah, and I ended up playing about four seasons over there. So that was a pro contract. Mm -hmm. Exciting. Yeah. You jump a plane, go to a country across the pond, yeah. and go. Fortunately, Norwegians are all very good at English, so that helps oh, good. a lot. Yeah. Good. Soccer wouldn't be something that I would think that it would be prevalent in that country, but it uh, is. They have a really strong women's soccer history. Yeah. yeah. They won back in '95, and then they kind of had 15 years of being the, like top three teams. Yeah. They've That's dipped right. a bit in the last few years, but yeah, they were great. A lot of those countries over there are fantastic pro um, leagues. Uh, how long were you there for? I think you said, but how long were you there? I was off and on with the national team. It kind of depended on tournament years, but I played there from 2008 till 2012. I was kind of there for a couple half seasons and then a couple full seasons. So after London, I played my last half season there. Hmm. How is soccer embedded in that community? What's it, what's, what does the community respond to soccer in, in Norway? In Norway? Yeah. Uh, it was great. They have a really strong football club um, dynamic. So a lot of them are smaller towns that are kind of built around their sports clubs. Uh, I played for Lillestrøm. And the sports club means the men's team, the women's team. It means the handball team. Handball's huge over there. Or the curling team or whatever it is. And it's all under that sports banner. And if you grow up in that town, you love that, that sports team uh, and a lot more of the players stay involved in the clubs when they're done playing too mm -hmm. which is great so it has a really strong community feel for sure so wh why why did you decide to turn pro you, how old were you when you decided to turn pro uh, I graduated I was 23 yeah. I guess and then like I said I wanted to keep playing for Canada and I wanted to keep playing soccer and see where it took me and to 
to do that and to succeed and to keep getting better, you had to play your round professionally. So, how often were you co going to camps, Canada camps, in, while you were with uh, Norway mm -hmm. coming back? Uh, in tournament years, we'd be in and out pretty frequent, frequently, and then leading up to a tournament, we might be out like a couple months before, and then camps maybe three, four, five times a year. It wasn't quite as busy as it is now. Mm -hmm. How do you feel, up until that point in time, how do you feel your game had progressed mm -hmm. into the professional world? Uh, I think Norway was a great experience for me because they have already a very high technical standard, so their first touch, their passing, all that, the standard's really high, so it kind of pushes you to, to push your threshold. Uh, at the same time for Canada, we played very direct soccer mm -hmm. at that time, as some people may recall. And Evan had told me I had to get way better at striking a ball, you know, hit that ball 40 yards onto Christine's foot so she didn't have to run too hard to score all her goals. Uh, so that was something I was really focusing on too, just hitting the ball. So I'd, I'd practice different distribution all the time on my own too. So that was something that was getting better. So you found, did you, be, did you become more of an aggressive player after a few years in pro? Uh, no, Canada at the time was kind of the world leader in that physical, intense soccer. So I think, yeah, Evan brought that out in us more than anything. So we'd rough up the Norwegians when we were nice. there. Yeah, they weren't used to it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so pro Nor Norway, and then at the same point in time, you guys were qualifying, Canadian national team was qualifying for Beijing, is that right? Yep, in 2008 we qualified for the Olympics for the first time. Mm -hmm. Did you your first Olympics? Yep. You walked that was out? pretty exciting. Yeah, so. So what's the quintessential moment for an athlete, isn't it? Is it walking out with the, with the flag and your team when you're introduced at the very beginning? Is that, were you, did you do that? Uh, we, as soccer, don't ever get to go to opening ceremonies. Because you have matches, right? Yeah, because yeah. soccer is the longest tournament, so we actually start games before the opening ceremonies have started. Plus, we're always in satellite cities, which means if the Olympics are in London, we're probably not in London. So you missed the Beijing. opening ceremonies? Yeah, we've never been to an opening ceremony. Well, tomorrow we'll just give you a Canadian flag to walk around yeah. with, right? We always watch it. We put it on the TV, yeah. and we put on our opening ceremonies outfit anyways. Oh, do you? So we feel like we're included. Uh, I don't know. if you, Did you guys see any footage of us? We, like, we're all in the outfits, and we carried a flag in, so you can feel like part of the team. But, yeah, we're watching from afar. Awesome. So, um, your first game, who did you play? Do you remember that? We played China in China for our opening game. Ooh, what was that like? It was loud. Lots and of people. And smoggy. Very so, smoggy. Oh, yeah. I bet. How many people yeah. were in the stadium? Do you remember? Oh, I'm sure it was sold out. Ah, okay. So probably 30, 40,000. Yeah. And Chinese fans are pretty good soccer fans, so they're, ni they're nice and loud. Had you ever played in front of a crowd that big before? Um, yes, because at Pan Am's the year before, we were in Brazil, and we okay. played Brazil at Maracana in front of 70,000 fans, and those were those were mean fans. They were, like, oh, really? taunting us, yeah. You could hear them. South American fans can be mean sometimes, and they were mean, yeah. So the Olympic experience, your first Olympic experience, what did you take away from that? We learned a lot from that experience. We'd had mentors in. Uh, Marnie McBean was a, a rower for Canada who won multiple gold medals. She came in kind of mentored us. Um, and she made a point of saying, don't be a tourist at your first Olympic Games, don't get too wrapped up in everything. Uh, but the truth is a lot of first time Olympians don't medal because there is so much going on. And that was definitely true of our team. We'd never been in such a big multi-games experience before, you know, with Kobe Bryant walking down, Messi was in the village when we were in the village next to us. Like there are a lot of distractions going on. And uh, we did okay, we lost to the US in the quarterfinals in overtime. Uh, and then we were done and we had a week off at the Olympics, so we just had fun. Like we watched other events, we hung out. The Olympics is ridiculous, like everything's free, food's free, you can do whatever you want. It's like a bubble within a bubble within a bubble. But from that games, we really learned to not be a tourist at the Olympics. Like you're there to win games. And then when we went into London, there was at least half of us, probably 50, 60 percent, who had been to an Olympics and could, then could pass on that real knowledge to the younger players. So when we hit London, like we were, we were way more prepared. And for sure, that Beijing experience allowed us to to mm -hmm. win games in London. So uh, Beijing is over. How soon did you start preparing for London? What was the next goal? And how soon did you start preparing for it? Um, there's some messy stuff between Beijing and London. Because we had um, a new coach, mm -hmm. Carolina came in, uh, Italian coach. Evan made the program professional, and then Carolina made us like soccer players. Mm -hmm. So we got uh, more tactical, more technical, a little more tiki-taka style. She took the program up another level. 
Um, we, we didn't do well at all in the World Cup in 2011. That was kind of the next thing. We had, we were kind of peaking in terms of age, experience, talent, and we just bombed out of that tournament. Um, they don't really keep track of who came last, but we came last that tournament. Mm -hmm. uh, and then she resigned, and then John came in, and that was kind of the lead up towards London. Was that a turning point when he came in? Yeah, absolutely. He, Carolina took us to another level, but we were kind of. So John, a so John Herdman is the, the Canadian women's national team coach. Yeah. Okay. You guys know who John is, right? He's that good-looking guy at the cut side of the field. No? Um, it's John L. What's the question? It's John L. Is that, is that the is that the is, was was that the is, was that the turning point? Yeah, oh yeah. Like I was saying, we we were in a great place as a team. Like we'd grown a lot under Carolina, but we were kind of broken. Like we're like, are, are we never going to get to that next level? Uh, and John came in, and the first thing he did was kind of empower us, and he asked us, "Who are we as a Canadian team? What do we stand for? What do we want to be?" And he kind of took all that and, and built us back up again. And we had the Pan Am Games. Mm -hmm. He'd been in three months. We went to the Pan Am Games in Mexico, where we won gold. We beat Brazil mm -hmm. in penalties. Uh, and then it was a six month lead up to London from there. So we'd only had him nine months before London. That's a very short period of time. Mm -hmm. So let's just go back for a second. You said we were broken. Mm -hmm. What does that look like? What does that feel like? There'd been a, a lot of players involved in the program a long time and we just couldn't seem to break that next level where we were actually felt like we were succeeding and, and reaching our potential. And it was just frustrating and people were questioning whether they wanted to, to keep doing it, I think. And, and John just brought in a fresh passion and you could feel his own love of the game and it was kind of contagious. In the dressing room sometimes, I think it's natural for teammates to kind of question each other, whether one-on-one -on -one or just in your own head. Mm -hmm. So in, the, in that period of time, where, where, were those questions in your head? Do you think those questions were in your teammates' heads? Uh, are we the right group of people to get to the next level? Um, I, I'm not sure. I mean, we had... It was interesting because it was, it was the exact same group of players, almost to the players to the player who came last in Germany in 2011 in the World Cup and then who got to that podium mm -hmm. in 2012. Uh, but it was just, I mean, it was more the culture that John brought in in terms of having a positive growth mindset, team environment, uh, and that passion and that sense of joy and fun. It was kind of all that stuff off the field that John brought in more than anything. Do you think that was a big difference maker? The Absolutely. off the field stuff? So what yeah. kind of off the field stuff? What kind of culture pieces did he bring in? Uh, building the culture in terms of taking accountability of uh, players. Uh, with the older coaches, players would have been quicker to blame tactics blame coaches, blame player selection for performances instead of looking to ourselves first to see what it was. Uh, being more proactive and making connections one-on-one -on -one between players, even if a player wasn't your best friend, but making sure you had some sort of connection with them. Really strong in the honest communication between the team. He just fostered all that positive team environment, and that's for sure the difference in London that there was being able to make it to the bronze medal game, and then that's for sure what got us through the France game. I mean, France outplayed us. France is an incredible team. They should have won multiple medals in World Cups right now, but what they're lacking is that same thing that we had in London, and it's that team connection. Hmm. So in the 93rd minute, when we were exhausted, I mean, we scored that goal, but there were about seven Canadian players around the 18-yard box. I we saw had that. no business being around the 18-yard box in the 93rd minute. And so if I didn't put that ball in, someone else definitely was going it, to. They just wanted it that bad, would you say? Everybody was coming Yeah, in. everyone was. You could see it in players' eyes, like people were exhausted, but nobody was going to let someone else run past them, or you were never going to quit on that person beside you. So we're going to switch the table just a little bit, and uh, I want to invite someone who can, who, who we can both talk a little bit about uh, preparing for training, preparing for matches, and so on, and what that mental fortitude looks like. So uh, I'd like to invite up our uh, head coach from FC Evanston, Mr. Colin Miller. Yeah. So Colin, I, I appreciate you. Uh, I appreciate you joining us. Joining us, I know you got a we got a big game tomorrow, so you probably you probably would be at home watching tapes and getting ready, right? Yes, I have no life. 
<laughs> Come on, you're, you're at home watching Sean demand eating chips like the rest of us, right? <laughs> okay, so I appreciate you coming out today. I, I, I want to talk a little, first of all, how do you two know each other? Let's, let's let everyone know how you know each other. Well, the girls are probably thinking, how could the men's national team, ex-national team coach be sitting beside the, for me, the, and I'm going to embarrass Dan, and I actually said to her after the Olympics, uh, I don't know if she'll recall it or not, but I actually believe that this is the most talented Canadian national team player. Other Nobody players, agrees with you. Other <laughs> players get lots of plaudits, and rightly so, but I look at different things in players, and this young lady, I believe, has got a genuine football brain. Genuine football brain. And when you watch her closely, you'll understand what I mean. But how we came to, to meet was uh, I was invited into uh, the Cyprus Cup with, uh, no it wasn't, it was the original one was with Evan Pillarud where I first met Diana and, and uh, I got invited in a couple of times with Evan and then a number of times with John Herdman and it was such a privilege for me to, to work with the girls because my professional career lasted 18 years uh, so I went straight from 33 years of age which seems like the dinosaurs, it was that long ago now uh, working solely with professional football players and now uh, when I when I retired my family moved back to Abbotsford BC which is where Sophie Smith is from and Sophie was the first player I actually moved as the head coach of the Abbotsford Soccer Association. <coughs> Anyways getting back to my story I'm Scottish and I can tell a few stories as you can tell but um, the so I, I got invited into being one of John Herdman's technical staff for the residency to prepare for the London Olympics. And I could have gone as one of his staff members, but I was still part of the Bank of the Whitecaps. I was the assistant coach of the Bank of the Whitecaps, and I didn't want a conflict to be there. So long story short, um, I got the chance to work with the girls on almost a daily basis. Went to uh, Sweden, went to the States, and uh, a number of different places with the women's national team. And I got to see firsthand how much the girls actually cared about the game. Because in my world, it was win, win, win at all costs. Fight tooth or nail, kick your granny to win. And it meant the same to the girls, to the women. It meant exactly the same. And uh, I had such a respect for the women after the first trip when I came back from Evan Pellerud's trip. Because I saw the very first training session the girls were into a routine and they had to do some warm-ups on their own, they had to do specific things. And each player went into a zone here, went into a zone. And that was their preparation. Everyone had to do certain things. They did all that and then everything came together for the actual practice. And I thought, these players, and I treat the men's team as the same as the women's team, it's, it's a player to me. And I was the head coach of the Abbotsford Soccer Association from 2000 till 2007, 2008, when I went back to England in the English Premier League for Derby County. And I hadn't worked with girls before. Never worked with girls before. So it, was, it actually made me a better coach. I had to become a bit of a social butterfly because the girls, we all like to have a, a wee chat and a giggle and so on and so forth. So I had to get that around my head and, and not be so serious all the time. And it made me a better coach. It made me a better coach for sure. But I, I, I'm going to ramble on just for one split second more before I forget. One of the things that has jumped out at me, and this is a, for the players here, was it wasn't all successes for Diana at the start of her career, if you remember back girls. And I was once told at the age of 14 that I was too short, too slow and too fat. It's still an accurate assessment, that's for sure. <laughs> but I responded in the same way Diana did. So there'll be times during your life, girls, in your football career and just your general, where things don't go quite your way, quite the way you want them to go. Our first team at the moment is not where we want them to be. But I'm not giving up. None of the players are giving up. They're all motivated to be the best and to try to get up that league as much as possible. The same principles apply to this young lady who's now become one of our most decorated international football players in our country's history. 
So you will get some setbacks in your life. It's how you respond to that. Just because one coach says you're not good enough, does that mean you're a bad player? I've just said the same thing to our academy boys tonight because there was a big tryout tonight for our, our boys academy. So the parents were there and I said the same thing to those players. It's the same principles. Just because one coach says you're not good enough and I never tell a player that they've made the team. You've made it when you retire. So I've made it now, ladies, that's for sure. <laughs> a long time ago, in fact, some would have said I should have made it many, many moons ago. So, uh, so don't ever give up. Don't ever give up. Continue to work. Continue to try your best. Be motivated to practice every day. Listen to your coaches. Listen to what's being said. And try to apply those things as much as you can. Sorry, I rambled on. That's okay. I'm used to it. Um, <laughs> So uh, you, you actually played both Olympics, actually, and you had injuries at those times, or was it in Rio that you played through an injury? Um, yeah, the last few years have been rougher. I had knee surgery the fall before yeah. London, uh, that healed fine, uh, and then I had bigger injury problems leading into the World Cup out, out here, yeah, so I didn't yeah. get to play in Edmonton, unfortunately. It's okay. You were here in spirit, I think. I was, um, I was also here physically, I just didn't get to play. Yes, also so, in spirit. Yes, also in spirit, yeah, I get it. So, okay, so um, you come in at about that time in that nine month gap, right, when John's on board, and the, all this preparation has to happen for London. There is the beginning of a culture shift, right, and Diana has wit started to witness it. Did you witness it at that time as well? Did you see that shift starting to happen as they were preparing for London? Uh, I saw the the commitment, first of all, from the staff's point of view, I saw how hard the staff were working to make everything as possible as they could for the players to be successful. And then we saw it from the meeting onto the training pitch, and you could see that there was something genuinely positive happening. Diana spoke about the positive environment that John Herdman instills in all of the girls. And they love it, they can't get enough of it. And, mm -hmm. and I saw that and I went, these players are genuinely buying in. Something special is gonna happen here. How early on in that process was the goal set to medal in London? I probably think it was from day one. Is that right? being hired. Is that right? Day one, pretty much. John's or, or a planner. He's scary. He yeah. um, he shows us a poster he took to the job interview. That's um, it has about 20 different things on it, but it's I mean it's got scary things like back-to-back -back podiums, which he did it earlier than he planned, but he still did it. It's got top four in the world. It's got women leading women. It's got like line after line after line that he's he's managed to do already. So that was that was. So that was, that was his the vision? job interview, so he hadn't even met us yet. Oh, okay. So that and was his vision. I can remember, I mean, it must have been, he was only with us nine months, but it was pretty early on where he had pictures, probably as soon as the London medals, the design was announced, mm -hmm. he had those images up and they'd be a part of our really? meetings regularly to be. There's the They're goal, ladies. Yeah. And it was the, the goal was the podium and it was to see the flag rise on the podium. And that was it. That was the messaging that took us through the whole tournament. So he comes in right away and starts posting up the pictures. Here's the goal. Here's, did everyone buy Buy in right away, or did it take mm -hmm. time? Everyone bought in right away. No, I, no, I don't think so. Time. I mean, we were coming from a place where we were like, well, yeah, we've been trying to get there for years. Yeah, just because you say it now doesn't mean it's going to happen. Um, but I think slowly and surely, what we were doing on the training field and in, in the gym and in the mind room where we did all the mental work and in the grow room where we did all our video, all that stuff started to, to build more belief in everyone and, and we started to get more consistent performances and results leading up to the tournament. What can coaches do to help young players prepare mentally for, for matches? Um, and how can they develop that? How can, what role do coaches play in the development of that, of the vision of where uh, players want to be? I think, uh, I think youth coaches, we've probably got a few here tonight, I think youth coaches have to realize the importance of the information that you give young players. So it can't all be rah, rah, rah stuff. At some point, we have to coach them. So I worked for uh, Holger Osiek, who was a men's national team coach for two and a half years. And he said, we reward mediocrity in Canada. We say unlucky when I've missed the goal from here and it's gone over the bar. 
when it's not unlucky, it's poorly. And I think we have to find the balance now of giving players proper instruction, proper instruction. And as a coach, know your limitations. If you're coaching well above your means, these young players will get lost. So if you can take a player so far, and as I said, Sophie Smith was the first player I actually moved when I came back to Canada, because Sophie was so far ahead of the girls that were in her level, I moved her up a year and a bit. And her coach at the time, his name was Roy Miller. He was, oh, geez, oh, you've taken my best player. What's gonna happen to my team now? But he was so enthusiastic about it because he had played a role in Sophie's development. And she, she was now ready to go to the next level. And he was so happy to pass the player on. So I would say to the coaches that are here, be constructive. Um, it's not a shouting, yelling, screaming match. Um, it, it's about being constructive and as positive and realistic as you can be. As positive and as realistic as you can be during your training session. Make it fun. It has to, you have to have a smile on your face. You have, you're playing the best sport in the world. Do you remember the best advice that a coach ever gave you? Ooh, for soccer? Was it Colin? Probably not, right? No. Um. If you could give one piece of advice, then. Oh, well, that's di that's a different question. To everyone here, what would that be right now? Uh, All the young players. I mean, I don't have super exciting mm -hmm. advice. I mean, it's to have work hard. fun. Yeah, it's super cliche. Have fun, work hard. Mm -hmm. But it is. If you find something you love doing, just be willing to work harder than other people at it. That's that's the secret. Uh, I said I was cut from the provincial team the first time I tried out, and the story is the same, honestly, for almost all of the girls on the team, except maybe Christine Sinclair. She told me she was cut from something, but I didn't believe her. Yeah. I don't think she was. <laughs> but everyone else, like Karina LeBlanc was, uh, Melissa Tancredi was, all these players have had huge setbacks, but they were willing to put in the work because they loved what they were doing. And that might not be soccer, that might be anything you do. And I guess the one advice that stands out doesn't really have to do with soccer, but it was leading up to the World Cup in 2015. So World Cup at home, I'm an older player, I'm fully appreciating how lucky I am to get to play in a World Cup in Canada, like mm. just have to get the timing right for that to happen. Uh, and I blew my ACL the November before, so seven months out from the World Cup. So no problem, I can get back from an ACL in seven months, that's doable. Uh, but then I broke my foot during the recovery, right? That sucks. So then March, it was about three months out from the World Cup. I hadn't come back from my knee yet. I broke my foot. And I was still trying to get back from the team. Uh, and John Herdman and I had a great talk where he's like, just find something where you are still enjoying this process. Because if you're not enjoying it still, it's not worth it. So whatever, whatever you're doing, make sure you enjoy it. So we're going to go open up for questions in just a couple of minutes, but I just I, I just got to go back to London because there's all this preparation, there's nine months, and then you find yourself in the UK for the Olympics. And was the goal, was the vision as clear at that point in time when you landed as it was that the vision that John had laid out nine months earlier is probably even more clear? Yeah, we were, we were so clear going yeah. into London. I think Metal. John's really good at planning, putting in the work, the really complicated stuff months and months ahead. So as you get closer to a big game or a big tournament, he kind of simplifies everything. So the players are just in a clear space of mind to be able to go perform. And we arrived in London. He gave us two days off in London to go have fun, like go see a show. Most of the girls went to see The Lion King, so they were singing it the rest of the tournament. It was so annoying. Uh, and then after that, we went to Coventry, where we played most of our games. And as soon as we got to Coventry, it was just business, business. mode. And it helped that Coventry is the most boring city in all of England, which people also told me there. So there wasn't much else to do, but we were just honed in to soccer. And from that point forward, it was, it was clear. And that helped after the US loss as well. The goal was to make the podium, and we were in the position to make the podium with one more win, so it was just getting back on that messaging again. Any, can you just describe, and this is the last question I'll ask you, can you describe the moment um, when that medal was hung around your neck? Uh, it, was, it was surreal, again, I think. Yeah, it was just, it was a dream come true, 
standing on the podium with your best friends through everything you've been through over over the years was just pretty cool. Even the tournament itself was such a cool journey from oh, we didn't play well the first game, we tied Japan, we got a result against a team we usually should beat second game. Third game we were down 2 nothing to Sweden in the first 20 minutes in a game we needed to win. And it was at St. James Park in Newcastle, which is John Herdman's like hometown team. He was like beside himself he got to coach on that sideline. Uh, and we tied that game, got exactly the result we needed to play the team we wanted in the next round. We got to beat England at home, which was fun. That crowd mm -hmm. was so quiet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Were you following? You were obviously following from home. Anytime England get beat, it's a good thing. Um, that was actually the UK team. So yeah, there were some yeah, Scots on right. the team. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about they that. They were good players. Also. There, there were, yeah. <laughs> but, but we were also you were following the team, obviously, from Canada. But you were back yeah, in Canada, right? Yeah, it was amazing because my, my family I were up in the interior of BC on a bit of a vacation. So it was... Every game was was televised, of course, and and one of the, the the biggest thrills that I've had in my life was after the girls won the bronze medal, they were on the bus driving to was it Manchester or London? We had to go back to Wembley to get the medal, yeah, because we played in Coventry again. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I was uh, we had come home from the vacation, and I watched the game with with my daughter and and family, my wife and, and son, we watched the game. And the girls actually phoned me from the team bus. Really? From where they had played the, the bronze medal game on there. And they that, called you from the Yeah, bus. they called me. It was uh, it was quite a thrill. It was quite a thrill, because you, you don't think you make an impression on people, but mm. clearly I did, to, to some of them anyway. But uh, it was a, it was pretty neat. It was pretty, yeah, but the whole country followed it. Jay, it was, uh, mm -hmm. it was amazing. I, Which we I, had I no idea. That. Like we were in our Olympic bubble. We'd learned past lessons yeah. to not be distracted, to be focused in. So like people, Twitter wasn't as popular yet, so it made it easier. Like I don't think Instagram existed. Definitely no Snapchat. Um, but we put ourselves in a bubble where like you weren't reading the media, you weren't doing that because it was just going to be a distraction. So we had no idea how excited people got over here until yeah. literally we landed back in Canada oh, and yeah. we were like, what happened? Yep. Like, it was nuts. Yeah. yeah, it lifted a nation up. It really did. It was crazy.